Okay, so this is now lecture 12, NE402 Intermediate Nuclear Engineering, covering neutron diffusion, transport, uh, and uh, Monte Carlo simulation. <clears throat> uh, I begin week six, lecture 12, on neutron transport. And my name, cell number, personal email, official email, and my website. And as I said, I'll be really happy to answer your uh, questions, look into your uh, feedback, whatever you like. Okay, so now I'm coming to little, a little bit much better than the neutron diffusion equation. So this is where we begin the transport equation. Now transport equation uh, uh, includes the uh, angular flux. So it's a proper conservation uh, equation. And you can think of it as the zeroth moment of the Boltzmann transport equation. Now Boltzmann did a lot of work for the kinetic theory of gases. And uh, it was uh, he who first derived this. And uh, the Boltzmann transport equation goes to many, many branches of science and engineering. So just like that, it comes into uh, neutron transport and it extends into X-ray transport, photon transport, charged particle transport. And so today we'll be looking at uh, neutral particle transport, so neutrons. And uh, so this transport equation I'll show you is an integral differential equation. It can be solved analytically for a very small class of problems, which uh, you could think of as highly idealized problems, which do not address uh, real world problems due to the geometric, uh, geometric and material complexities of real life. Now, in the early days, several analytical solutions were found for what they called infinite media and semi-infinite semi media with simplified scattering models. So this was the work of the 60s and the 70s when uh, there was more interest on radiative transfer. Stars, stellar atmospheres, <clears throat> and so this was called the radiative transfer equation. So if you look at the old scientific literature, then you see this as radiative transfer. And uh, now, of course, in the transport uh, equations to solve realistic situations, so numerical techniques are being used, such as uh, there are so many numerical techniques. There's the discrete ordnance method, there's the spherical harmonics method, there's the finite volume method, is the boundary element method, and so on and so forth. And these have been refined and refined and refined to a very high level uh, now. Now, when I was a student at Queen Mary College, when I was doing my final year project in 1978, so my project that I had chosen was the discrete ordnance method and the spherical harmonics method for the transport equation. Dr. Peter Smith was my supervisor. And uh, so my, <clears throat> uh, my first knowledge of discrete ordnance and spherical harmonics goes back to uh, 42 years from before. <clears throat> okay, so now uh, what is my objective here? The objective is to look at the structure of the neutron transport equation. What is it? And uh, when you go through the literature, then you find that there are so many forms in which it is expressed. So there are at least eight forms that uh, uh, I am uh, aware of. So there are eight forms of the neutron transport equation, which I am aware of. And uh, uh, these are the integral form, the even odd parity, the slowing down kernel, the multiple collision form, the invariant abetting, singular integral, pseudo flux, and the Green's function formulations. In addition to the Monte Carlo form, which although it's a stochastic simulation of the transport phenomena, it can be interpreted to be a Neumann series solution of the integral equation. Now, each one of these forms has mathematical properties that enable a class of solutions. So let me uh, uh, consider just two of these eight forms. And uh, so I'll consider the integral differential form of the neutron transport equation, and then I'll take you to the integral form of the neutron transport equation. 
So before I start the mathematics, let me show you this little picture over here and just uh, describe what's happening. So if you look at this red circle and this red circle, so imagine there's a neutron over here uh, and imagine there are many neutrons over here. So N, capital N, is the number of neutrons per cubic centimeter, per energy interval, per solid angle, per second. And these are all over here at some time T. So in this packet, if you multiply by dV, dE, d omega, the interval, then this is the number of neutrons that are now available. Now they start moving and you know neutrons can move very fast. <clears throat> so if they move in this unit direction, so I've denoted uh, as in all textbooks, the solid angle as a vector, omega bar underneath it, dash and a hat. The hat means it's a unit vector. So it's a vector, it's a unit vector, it's got magnitude one. So the neutron starts moving in that direction. And if I look delta t seconds later, so if I'm now at time t plus delta t, so what's happened? What's happened is that r has changed. In this direction, it's moved a certain distance s in the, in the direction omega. And that s is v times delta t, the speed times the time. So R has now changed, but how many of them still remain in the packet? Now, if capital sigma was your uh, total macroscopic cross section, then the number of collisions that took place between these two red circles was sigma times the distance the neutrons traveled, which was V times delta T. So if I subtract this from one, if this is expressed as a probability, then out of these hundred, if 20 got lost from the packet due to collisions, so now 80 of them are left. So this is an estimate of how many are left in the second red circle. So let's say I'm interested in writing down an equation for the balance over here. So the neutron started over here. They've reached here, delta T seconds later. When they come here, they find some other neutrons also. Now, so basically they find two different kinds of neutrons. One, which had their collision somewhere else. You know, like in one of the previous lectures, I introduced you to the collision density. So they had their collisions at some E prime in some omega prime and in delta T, they collided and they came from E prime, omega prime to our area, our phase space of interest, which is E omega. So these are the in-scattering terms. Now, there's also a possibility of some neutrons coming direct from the source. So let's write those as Q. Now, for the time being, I'm not, I'm not uh, limiting myself to fission or uh, non-multiplying media. So, so now, for the time being, consider all sorts of media. We'll, in, we'll include fission through this little F that you see over here. So we're going to say that, uh, you know, this is a general kind of an equation, okay? So that's uh, very good. Okay, now, I hope you've understood this. I, um, do I need to repeat it again? That I'm going to write a balance equation for this red circle over here. So what's over here is what's coming from here plus what's coming from here plus what came from here. So I'm going to write this as the sum of three terms. So I'm interested in phase space. And this I told you at the beginning of this course, three variables, two variables, three plus two is five, five and one, six and one, seven. So I'm looking at a seven dimensional space, if you will. And <clears throat> if, if you imagine that, and so the neutron travels a distance V, the speed times delta T in the unit vector direction, omega hat. <clears throat> Thus, delta T seconds later, you've got so many, as I told you, some are lost from the packet. And uh, the change, now look at very carefully over here. So when they got to delta T, their position had changed and the time had changed. So they started from here and out of these four quantities, you can see that two have changed out of those two. 
So when I write a derivative, I can only let one of those change. So now two of those have changed. So now I have to look at the changes separately. Okay, so between this and this, let me subtract something and add the same thing. So from here, let me subtract a term, which is at R, the old position, and the new time. So here, what's the difference between these two? The same time, the same future time, but the future minus the present, minus the past, or you can say the present minus the past space. Plus, because I've subtracted this, so I've got to add it. So the difference of these two, there's no difference in R, there's a difference in T. So this is going to be the time derivative, and this is going to be the space derivative. Okay, now in the usual way, so let me uh, lump these together. So let me write uh, the n at the new place as what was at the old place plus a q. Now in this q, I've lumped the scatterings, the in scatterings and the direct source contribution. So I've lumped uh, both of them. Okay, just to keep it small, short, and understandable. So this becomes the transport equation. Now the only problem is that it's got something else over here, something else over here, something else over here, and something else over here. So as I said, let me subtract and add these two terms. Uh, the red ones are the uh, little uh, artifact that I've introduced in here. And now let me notice these two and these two. So Let's try to do that. So if you notice, then the subtraction of these two divided by delta t gives me v times omega dot grad n. Now the omega dot grad n comes if you open, if you look at this diagram over here, if you open this omega, so in Cartesian coordinates, there's an x, there's a y, and there's a z. So omega is made up of omega x component plus omega y component plus omega z component. So I've got to open the r plus v omega hat delta t into an x, y, and z terms. And when you do that, then omega x d by dx plus omega y d by dy plus omega z d by dz come out. And you can see that the scalar product comes naturally out of this difference of these two terms. <clears throat> Now let's look at the other two, other two terms that are relatively simpler because there's only a difference in t. And so this is the partial derivative with respect to time. So now the equation that I had above where I express a small q is that, uh, let me take you to, this one over here. So I'm going to show you, I'm, so this minus the, this n lets this one remain on the right hand side and two from here. So three terms on the right hand side and two on the left hand side. So we've got a total of five terms. So two plus one, three plus one, four plus one, five. So this and this come out of the, the two terms and n's that I just showed you. And so this becomes our integral differential transport equation. Now, it's elegant, and what you see is a first order partial differential equation. Uh, what you see is a very difficult equation. And uh, I'm not going to tell you that we can solve it. So, because actually we cannot obtain an exact analytical solution to this. If you can, then you're very lucky. Okay, so there were people like Mill, Wiener, Hoff, and uh, you know people did it for all sorts of Chandra Sekhar, and uh, but the best, most elegant solutions I've seen are by uh, Ganapong, and uh, he's done some very uh, outstanding, exact analytical forms, and I've also seen work by Mike Williams, Professor Mike Williams, who has used mathematics to such a high level where you could test your uh, big computer codes with his mathematics. You know, so that's the, that's the limit in, in the artistic beauty of 
mathematics, the elegance. So equation 4.1 is the neutron transport equation. Now, let's put it in terms of the operator L hat. So if you put it in terms of the operator L hat, you can write equation 4.2. Now, so this is the outscattering term, and these are the inscattering terms. So now I told you that this includes fission and non-multiplying and multiplying. So let's look a little bit carefully. Let's magnify the scattering term. So the scattering term can be written as the initial energy multiplied by the probability of coming to the final energy and the final angle. Notice now that omega and omega prime are not written separately. They're written as the dot product of the two angles, which means that it's just the cosine of the angle between these two unit vectors that is actually important. And so far I've showed you a relationship between the two angles uh, in terms of the energy E prime and energy E in the lab system related to the center of mass system. So if I extend that and write it in terms of the angle in the lab system, then this would be a function of just the square root of E over E prime and the square root of E prime over E, of course, multiplied by the relative mass of the target uh, nu nuclei relative to the neutron. So look at this M over here. Now M includes everything, everything possible. It includes scattering, uh, which means elastic and inelastic. It includes absorption, it includes fission and is defined in such a way that if it's the scattering term, then it's the value one. If it's fission, then it's the value nu bar, where nu bar can be 2.5, can be 2.6 for uranium. Uh, so it's the average number of neutrons emerging from a fission. So for fission, the other thing that you got to include in the PK is the fission spectrum, chi of E. In other words, how many of these neutrons emerging from fission, which are actu actually high energy neutrons, how many are going to the energy of interest, which is E? <clears throat> so if you look at this probability, you integrate it, it sums out to one, which is what I always tell my students, that if anybody tells you it's a probability, immediately try to uh, integrate it over the limits and see that do you get a one. If you don't, then there's something wrong with it. So d omega over four pi gives you one and chi e between zero and all the energies possible has got to integrate to one. So that's correct. So let's look at the full form of the steady state neutron transport equation. So here's the streaming term. Here's the outscattering term. Here's the inscattering term. Here's the fission term with the multiplied by the fission spectrum. So how many get to contribute into your phase space of interest? And here's your direct source. Now it's uh, the mathematical properties of this equation are that number one, it's an integral differential equation. Number two, it's first order. Number three, it's linear. Now linear is a very important property of the transport equation. Linear means that if you've got three sources, and first you solve it for S1, obtain phi1, then you solve it for S2, obtain phi2, then you solve it for S3, obtain phi3. Then the solution of all the three sources will be phi1 plus phi2 plus phi3. So that is the another property of this equation. And because it's like that, then you can use Green's function. Now the, the, green, the Green's function says that if you have a source at R naught, E naught, omega naught, and you want to see the effect of that on some other place, R E omega, then the response of the source at the new position, at the detector position, is actually the Green's function. So it is this Green's function approach which allows us to do so many things with the transport equation. Now, it's an equation which means that it must be having boundary conditions and uh, the boundary conditions and the interface conditions are very similar to what I took you through for the diffusion equation. And so they've got to be flux and current continuity because things cannot just disappear. So if a neutron uh, goes out of an interface, it must come out of the interface the other side. 
If it doesn't, then there's something wrong with your modeling. And of course, your results will be totally unrealistic. So the flux and current, current also, the, the uh, current going out, the grad, has to be continuous. So if a neutron travels a distance s in the direction omega hat, then this quantity has got to be constant across the interface. In other words, that the new position of the neutron with the same energy at a later time, distance divided by speed, must be constant across the interface. So that is the interface condition. Now, n dot omega hat could be positive or negative. Now, positive would mean that it is leaving a surface, and negative would mean that it is entering a surface. Now, if you have a non-re-entrant or a convex surface or a free surface, that means a neutron can leave it but cannot re-enter. Now, if something can leave and not re-enter, and the boundary you can call B, so the N at all R's, at E and T, all R's on the boundary B have got to be zero for the coming back contribution. And a going in contribution, you can represent by N dot omega hat greater than zero. Now, now let's look at some special cases, plane and spherical geometry, because you know we call them regular geometry, and and uh, you should always test what you know with regular geometry with the simplest of models. So hopefully, when we uh, complete the lectures, then I would like to take you through a lot of exercises, give you a lot of problems, so that you understand all this. And ideally, what I would like to do is to finish all the theory in about. 35 lectures and to spend 10 lectures uh, with MATLAB programs and problems, discussing them with you so that it sinks in very well that what you've learned, how can you apply it? So this is a hands-on course. I want this to be not just something you watch on the board. You know, that famous definition of a lecture, uh, I, I don't remember, but once I was in a lecture as an, I think, undergrad or grad student, and a professor asked all of us, do you know the definition of a lecture? And he said, a lecture is something which goes from the board uh, uh, through your brain on the paper and doesn't stick to your brain. So that's what a lecture is. So <clears throat> and now I don't want that lecture of that sort. I want you to understand each and every bit of mathematics here because it's very powerful, it's strong mathematics. The concepts are strong. This is nuclear engineering. So it's, it's, a, it's something that has a lot of foundation and a lot of, a lot of strength in it. So, uh, so to rise to that level, you've got to understand the mathematics and the concept, and you have to put them together in your mind. And the third part of that is you've got to solve the problems. So how do you solve the problems? Either the old fashioned way with a pen and paper, these days with MATLAB also, because with MATLAB you can do wonders, you can see graphs, you can see solutions, and it's absolutely fabulous. Okay, so now let's look at a plane geometry in 1D. So the omega dot grad becomes mu d by dx in the geometry I showed you above. And let's average over all the angles. So let's get rid of the phi, because remember that d omega is d phi times d mu. Phi is the azimuthal angle, so I'm just going to get rid of it. Let me integrate over it so all this becomes mu d by dx, phi x mu e. So I've just got one angle left. So mu is cosine of theta. Similarly, the outscattering term, I'm going to integrate that over 2 pi and I get such a simple term. <clears throat> I'll do the same with the inscattering term and I get a simple term over here. I'll do the same with the fission contribution and I get rid of all the messy terms and I come to a very simple, good looking equation, which you see over here, 4.5. So I've got rid of the phi, the azimuthal angle. So what do I have left here? I've got x, the space dependence. I've, so this is a 1D problem. I've got angle theta, I've got E. So, and I've got E prime, so it's still quite difficult. Uh, so I need to reduce the complexity of this equation. 
Right now, I've got an energy-dependent, angular, space-dependent flux in three variables, and I've cut it down from seven to three variables. So, okay, now let's look at the terms. So I'll come back to this because I'll just show you some solutions. And um, the usefulness of those solutions, are their elegance, and what they tell us about the, uh, the, the, the shape of the angular flux. Now let's come to spherical geometry. Now in spherical geometry, omega dot, the radius of the sphere is cosine of theta. So omega dot grad n, r of mu, let me write this as dn by ds, where s is the distance traveled by the particle. So let me write the total dn by ds as the dn by dr plus the dn by d mu partial terms. So I've got to correct it with these terms over here. And these total derivatives, the dr by ds and the d mu by ds are you know, a piece of cake because I know that r is equal to s cosine theta, it says mu. So I can very easily write this term and this term over here. So that leaves me with d mu by ds is d mu by d theta, d theta by ds. And this gives me a sine squared theta over r. And because mu is cosine theta, so I write the sine squared theta because I don't want thetas over here, I just want mu's. So I put it as one minus mu squared over r. So <clears throat> the omega dot grad n as a function of r and mu becomes mu partial n by partial r plus one minus mu square over r dn by d mu. So this is the structure of the streaming term in spherical geometry. Well, I told you even that was difficult, so let's come down one order more. And let me assume uh, not at all sensible assumption, but let me assume for academic uh, progress uh, to continue this lecture, let me assume that a collision takes place, the angle changes and the energy does not change. Well, it doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, but, but, but let me please carry on with that because I'll show you something simple. There's no such thing as a one energy group of neutrons. Okay, but uh, let's try to reduce the complexity of this equation from three variables to two variables. So this is called the one speed neutron transport equation. <clears throat> so let me get rid of E. Now the way of getting rid of E is actually to integrate it over E, so I can't just drop E. I can say that this is the averaged energy averaged flux. Same thing I do with sigma T phi, the outscattering term, same thing I do with the inscattering term, same thing I do with the fission term. And let me make another assumption that chi of E is one. There's no other energy which an emerging fission neutron can go into. Well, and finally, the source is also a monoenergetic source. Okay, with all these simplifications, let us collect all the terms and write a one dimensional with azimuthal symmetry, one energy neutron transport equation in plane geometry. It reads this. And I hope you'd agree with me that equation 4.6 is simple. In other words, it's got two variables. Now, everything multiplying and non-multiplying, let me put in terms of something called C. And I'm going to show you that C is such an important uh, number by which we can separate or which the early, uh, early uh, our early colleagues of the 60s uh, that they used C to, to consider non-multiplying media separately and multiplying media separately. So imagine if I had no multiplication, so these terms would be zero. So C would be a number less than one. It would just be sigma S over sigma T, the sigma scattering over sigma T. So it would be the probability of scattering. If there is fission, then of course C would be a number greater than one. So it could be it could have the value nu bar. If there's an n to n reaction, it would have the value two. So we're going to look at values less than one first, 
and then I'm going to tell you what happens if the values are greater than one. Okay, now <clears throat> let's uh, scale the distance. <clears throat> so there I had pi x of mu, you can see over here. In this equation, I had pi x of mu. Now x is a real distance, it's centimeters or meters. So let's not say that. Let us say that we convert to what is called an optical distance. Now sigma t, capital sigma t, has units of per centimeter. So if I take units of optical units, in other words, the unit of distance measured in terms of a mean free path, then let me call it small z, and let me convert this into this, where now the variables are z and mu. So, and because that's what people did in the early days, and they assumed separability. And when you assume separability, that the function, sorry, I shouldn't have used chi over here. I used this for the fission spectrum, but uh, my little oversight. But let's say that this is a function of z, and psi is a function of mu. And when you assume separability, you assume an exponential form for mu. And you put this over here and try to obtain psi of mu. So, so these would be eigenfunctions, right? So, so beautiful. We've got an eigenfunction equation. And uh, when you put it in there, so Bell and Glassstone has this page 70. And this is what I used to very much like when I was doing my master's and Charlie Maynard was teaching us this course uh, that, you know, this is such an elegant one speed uh, result that you see over here. Now the problem is that how do you get these things? How do you get mu? So you look at this. I, this is a, is, a, is, a, is a mathematical identity that you'll find in books because when you integrate this, when you put this back into the governing equation over here, because this has got to be one, because there's a probability uh, of neutrons scattering between minus one and one. So when you do that, then you get uh, C nu naught over two natural log nu naught plus one over nu naught minus one. And you notice that this is the inverse tan hyperbolic function. So, so to find nu naught, the eigenvalues, you need to solve this transcendental equation. So that's exactly what I did. And I didn't try to even do that for C greater than one. So I did it for C less than one because the roots are real. And uh, because I just told you that when C is less than one, so things are nice and neat and simple because you've got sigma S over sigma T. And uh, so it's, uh, it's quite easy. So you can solve the transcendental equation in MATLAB and you can see for various values of C. Now this is a pure absorber. This is a pure scatterer. A pure scatterer would be <clears throat> something like, a good scatterer would be <clears throat> graphite and a good absorber would be what? Something which absorbs like uh, cadmium, like um, a good absorber, uh, you know, something which is hydrogenous. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, so when you do that, then this is the solution. This is the first solution that you're seeing. This is the first solution that I'm showing you of the asymptotic transport flux. Asymptotic in the sense that there's no source and it's far away from the boundaries and from the source. So you notice that there are two values of nu naught which came out of there. One is positive, one is negative. So it's both the fluxes with a negative eigenvalue and a positive eigenvalue. And the space dependence comes down uh, like this. And there's a angular dependence like this. So this is the first time, and this is a great step forward from diffusion where we could not even think of this. So this is the first expression that we've got of angular flux. We could not do this for diffusion theory. So we've come 
a step higher from diffusion theory. We've come into transport theory, but it's not very good because we've considered a source-free, infinite medium, uh, no energy loss in collisions, azimuthal symmetry, you know, so many as